And it was amazing because when we send them our working drawings, they actually then model every little detail uh, in the computer and then send it back to us and so that we could then see whether or not that it had been interpreted correctly. So in a way, the digital media became a means and a mode for the transfer of information. And these are some of the elevations, which are green walls and um, a number of other features. But what I do want to point out is that uh, these walls are actually made of the same kind of plaster you would find in the village, so it's a horse or plaster. In the base, remember those tiles, the roof tiles, so those would then be reused and stacked for the base of this building. And this is what it might look like at night with these two arms holding up this vessel of water with the landscape flowing in. And this is the village that inspired us so much, but we learned to be a little reluctant in mentioning it to too many of our clients because uh, of the associations. Even though we thought this is the best thing that we'd ever seen, um, the idea that it was associated with being a, a, a farmer's village had negative connotations. In fact, they want to sort of destroy all kind of connotations of the past in that sense. But this is the village of Hongsung, and it's really an extraordinary place. And what's beautiful about it is it sits right at the edge of a mountain range, uh, very much based on feng shui, where you have, to the north you have the mountains, to the south you have water, and it sits in a plateau, Water comes off of the mountains and filters through the city and through the village and then comes out into this beautiful pond and then you enter it by going across a bridge. Here's this bridge that you go across. And there's all these, uh, the moss and the filter, the, the, the natural vegetation which acts as kind of a natural filter for all the waste that comes through. Um, and the way the water is regulated and moves through the city is timed by the types of uses that are used, whether somebody's washing something or drinking and so on. The foundations of these buildings that are in there use these rounded stones, so the water, water can filter through the stones. And then they have these courtyards, much like the ones that Peter showed, except they're courtyards of water. And so you sit around and you see your own car within these courtyards. So this is the ceremonial entrance into this beautiful village. And you come into this place, and you realize this is an incredible harmony between all the pieces and parts that make this place. Um, and, and even the type of uh, 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 stones that are used and how they bridge across the canals, um, and this is, I think, a, just a wonderful example of how the water runs through the, the streets, and there's these seats, but they serve many functions, whether it's drying out clothes, food, or, or, or just for social gatherings. Um, and these are the kinds of public spaces that are created to celebrate and announce certain kinds of places within, within this village. So this, and here you can see, for instance, the different kinds of textures of stone that are used. These are some of the ones that are used in the foundation. And so we came away with, from this just totally inspired by the possibilities, but also recognizing that we couldn't be too literal and too um, you know, vocal uh, and transparent about our, our sources with our clients, because literally they would sometimes laugh if I mentioned Homesome. Oh, Homesome, ah, uh -huh. very funny. Um, but in fact, a lot of the lessons for sustainability were found in these places. And so this kind of transfer, um, I discovered I learned more through the process. And if we have just like three minutes, I could maybe just go through a couple of slides. These are then just to give you just you know vignettes of the types of incredible scenes that you see uh, in China today, um, and this of course again is Nanjing Street, and Shanghai is full of these icons of globalization. Um, whether it's the uh, the tower that was recently designed by KPF, um, which at the time was uh, the tallest building uh, in the world for a very brief time, um, and at one time the, this. This opening here was supposed to be a circle, but the concern was that it represented too much the rising sun of Japan, which of course is not a very popular symbol uh, in China. And then what's interesting is that right next to this uh, the tower, the KPF tower, is another tower, Jinmao Tower, designed by SOM, an American firm. Um, and uh, it, it tries to pick up on sort of the same architectural language we saw in Taiwan, but I think in a little more sophisticated way. And this skin is unbelievably uh, crafted. It's just extraordinary. But you get in the city amazing streetscapes. And what you learn is that the Chinese have done everything. They've learned lessons that we've, that from the West. Not all of them good, but they've taken them and they're already in the process of making them their own. In the same way, when the French came, the Italians came and split up uh, Shanghai into concessions, they took the typologies of the European housing types and made them their own by using filters, balconies, screens, etc. But here's a, this highway that just runs right through the city. And you know what? I think it's okay. It's actually pretty cool. And they have parks that come underneath it, you know, and there's a fascination with color. And the scale of it allows for these two different things to exist at one time. They have plants that run alongside the highway, so there's these little ladies that come along and they water the plants like cars are zooming by at high speed. 
and nobody ever gets hurt. But so you see this kind of relationship between the method of construction and the idea of the landscape. And the Chinese garden is full of these great examples when you talk about rock formations, where you know this idea of time, both immediate high pressure uh, uh, things that have to happen in an instant, but understanding of historic and generational time. Where these stones, for instance, are made not over one generation, over but multiple generations. They take the stone, they carve the acid uh, forms in it, they put it in the lake, and they pull it out after every couple of years to see how it's going. And after maybe two or three generations, they pull it out and go, here, here's your perfect stone. And so the making a park is not something that happens with one family, but over generations. This is in Nanjing, just to give you a sense of scale. Uh, this building is as tall as Hancock. This is the new tower that was built by SOM, uh, which has an office in Shanghai. Uh, this is built uh, right next to the biggest uh, wall of any city in the world, 33 kilometer wall in Nanjing. Uh, an extraordinary structure built uh, 700 years ago, still stands. This, if, if you ever wanted to have stop the problem with a big dig, do this. These inscriptions here on the stone say who made each brick. If there's ever a problem, you know where to go. <laughs> you can imagine what would happen. Now talk about sustainability too. What keeps this together is not mortar. It's the water that's left over from glutinous rice. And guess what? This thing is still standing. It's perfect. And if it weren't for the Japanese who bombed parts of it, uh, it much of it would still be completely intact. Most uh, Chinese cities, large or medium-sized cities like Nanjing, a city of 5.5 million, that's scheduled to be about 8.5 million within 10, 20 years, growing by 200,000 people a year, have these planning centers like, this, like our BRA, and they have these giant models. In fact, this model has outgrown its, its space. Um, and this shows the sort of development pattern. And there's this idealized notion of landscape and building being intertwined, but there's the reality too, which is not always true. This is also something you experience in China, the reality of what's said and what you actually encounter. Um, and it's a, obviously a sensitive topic. Here you can see the old city wall that surrounded the city. Here's a new axis. And traces of still these, uh, all these different conditions that have occurred over the last 700 years. The site we were working on is right here, fascinating location. Um, and again, you get a sense of the fabric. And they, what they really do is they produce housing. And I think what's happened is an interesting merger of communism and capitalism. Because they use the same methods of production, but they just turned and they just ramped it up with all this capital fuel, and so they come up with this system, which we we'll talk about later, how it actually works. But they just crank out this housing, and it's not very sensitive. And there's actually concern about a big bubble happening, and I think there's some reality there. And many of these places have these exhibits, places like this, where talk about globalization. They they bring in the worst of our our, our, our abilities and talents. So here they're literally trying to import American and European inspired typologies. We had a client that asked us to design 1,000 villas on a beautiful tea field. And we thought, oh, fantastic. It's going to be integrated with the tea fields, and we'll preserve the tea fields. And they said, no, no, I want to flatten it. I want you, you're American, build it look like California. And show me a picture. It looked like the worst Spanish colonial thing you ever imagined. <laughs> well, I said, I'm sorry, we can't do that. He said, why not? I said, we just can't. It's not right. I lost a job, and my, and my wife, I had a hard time explaining to her why I turned down a million dollar commission. But I thought it was the right thing to do. I did not want to flatten the hill. And some of that's happening. And this is the contrast of, of the cities, of how people are living in many of the older villages. And, they, and then what's happening is literally they're tearing down portions of it. I mean, just within an instant, the whole village will disappear. And then within minutes, within hours, capitalism emerges. And this guy came in with his little truck, and he's got a little factory going. There's people on a cell phone. And we've got four or five people working, uh, developing this in the shadow of Nanjing. And this is Beijing, the parting shots. This is the worst pollution day ever in Beijing. We were happy to be there that day. So this is what the uh, Forbidden City looked like. And this is what it's like to drive down the street. When we think about globalization, we have to be aware of this. Because this is about survival. And, and we, we cannot be making our, our, our discussions and decisions in isolation. We have to think about how we are all part of this whole planet. And how if we are going to make these transfers, they have to be ultimately to the benefit of a larger group, um, ourselves and the Chinese included. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is probably known to most of you uh, as the Pulitzer Prize winning architecture critic for the Boston Globe. I have to say that when I moved to this area, low these many years ago from Chicago, uh, I, I didn't know what to think about the archit architectural culture here. Um, but um, uh, Robert Campbell has helped me navigate it 
for all these years through his really insightful uh, writing about both buildings and the larger contexts in which they sit. And so please join me in welcoming Robert Campbell. like the two people you've just seen, so I don't have any pictures, and uh, I sort of comment on what other people do and kind of throw um, you know, explosives across the wall to disturb what's going on. Um, I'm going to tell you what little I know about globalization, and I hope that maybe we can get some more issues come up with the questions. I've never been in China, except that I taught for a few weeks at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which is a very different situation, but began to get some sense of that. Um, and I've just had an experience that uh, made me think about globalization. I am a juror in a competition to redesign the environments of the Gateway Arch by Aero Saarinen in St. Louis, uh, which is supposed to symbolize, although everybody's a little embarrassed by that symbolism now, the westward expansion of the United States, uh, which of course is not popular among the Native American population, so they keep redefining what the Gateway Arch is all about. But I was fascinated. We had, it was a competition, uh, everybody had to come in the form of a team. Each team had to have an architect, a landscape architect, a structural engineer, and an, an environmentalist, and on and on and on, an artist. Um, and every team could have been the United Nations. Uh, and I, I just try to remember as I was sitting down there, all different nationalities we saw, just among the five finalists that we finally got to last week in the second session. We started with 49 teams, and we come to nine, and then we come to five. Um, but uh, uh, German, British, uh, uh, Amsterdam, American, a wonderful artist from Mexico, um, and you know, German, uh, many, many different nationalities on each team, all as comfortable with each other and speaking the same language with each other as they could possibly be. And I realized that something has changed very much in my lifetime. That there really, as far as the world of global culture is concerned, there really is no such thing as local culture. And that's what I found so fascinating about the, about the two lectures that we just saw before, because both these guys are trying to find ways of thinking about global culture uh, as having been influenced by uh, local culture. And local culture is always in itself heavily influenced by local climate, local tradition, local history, local materials, uh, local lifestyle. And that's what worries me a little bit about uh, the kind of thing that, that, that we're seeing now. Uh, KPF and SOM, all these firms are known only by their initials. I, I, I'm RDC. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the initials make them seem um, anonymous. And in fact, they are anonymous. I can't tell looking at a building whether it's by Caesar Pelli or SOM or KPF or someone else. And they try to incorporate, as you saw in the, the kind of uh, Taiwanese building with the, the, the attempt to kind of look like a, uh, Chinese uh, pergolas, pergolas. Um, silly, silly, um, a Westerner's idea of what another culture might be, or what, what we used to call parachute architecture. The architects fly overhead all the time and they drop the buildings in the parachute so they don't have to learn anything about the local people. Um, I was fascinated also by the, uh, the Aga Khan, who was a classmate of mine at Harvard. Amazing, an amazing place. And so we have been in contact a little bit over the years. And he sponsors the Aga Khan Awards uh, for architecture in, Islamic, in the Islamic world. And I've talked to him, and his, his idea was very simple. He said, if I leave them alone, they will build Chicago all over again in completely inappropriate cultural and uh, climatic situations. Or they will build Disneyland. He doesn't put it this way, but that's what he was saying. They will do imitations of historic Islamic architecture that have nothing to do with current culture, current technology, current building systems. So what do you do? So he established a program where every three years they give about 20 awards. It's the most uh, carefully conceived and the most uh, uh, thoroughly researched awards program I've ever heard anything about. Um, and the idea is to find that middle ground, and I think that's what both you guys were talking about too, finding that middle ground that respects what, what respects the past and draws from the past and yet at the same time looks to the future and responds appropriately to the culture that we're in now. 
And those awards, there was, they've been fantastic over the years. There was a, an award, I remember, for a tree planting program in Turkey, uh, architecture uh, of a different kind. And uh, I think that's something we, we all have to look for. I myself have been in the Venetian Palace Hotel in Las Vegas, and I don't recommend it. Uh, I know you were only kidding, but uh, I explored it a little bit. I think they lose 300 gallons, 300, 300, 3,000 gallons of water a day in leaks. Uh, it's as bad as the big dig. Uh, and uh, I always want to find the real place. You know, if I walk down a street and I'm experiencing, I, it, let's say I'm in Venice. Venice is largely now a theatrical representation of itself. It's no longer a real city. And a lot of the palaces are owned by wealthy uh, groups or individuals who are there only for a few weeks of the year and they're just pietateurs among many pietateurs and there is no street life, street culture in that tourist part of Venice. There still is in some of the edge parts of Venice. But if I walk down a street in Venice, I want to imagine people are living in those houses and behind that bay window there's someone looking out at me. And uh, that garden that I see through the alleyway, someone is planning that garden, that you want to feel that real inhabitants are inhabiting your architecture. And if you don't feel that, uh, then suddenly it all becomes very shallow and uninteresting. And that, I think, is a threat that we, that we, do, we do face in the world. Um, Peter, very accurately, I love those maps you showed of the, uh, this, is the this is where all the architects live, this is where all the, where all the projects are. I've just been reading a wonderful book by Stuart Brand, I don't know if anybody knows it, but Stuart Brand many years ago when he was a drugged out hippie in San Francisco wrote the whole Earth Catalog and kicked off the environmentalist movement and the sustainability movement as much as any other human being did. Uh, now, 40 years later, older and wiser, he's published a new book in which he reverses all of those same positions uh, because of climate, because of the risk to climate. Uh, you need a new kind of environmentalism entirely. And so he argues, and I think it applies to everything we're seeing here, one, uh, we need a new source of energy and nuclear is green. Two, highly dense cities are green. And in fact, as some of you may know, Manhattan is the greenest uh, city in the United States uh, by far uh, in energy per uh, consumption by the population or energy per consumption, consumption by dwelling units. And three, the one I really love, that uh, 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 genetic manipulation of plants and animals is green. And I, I think that we've all got to wake up to the fact that a lot of the things that we thought of as being uh, particularized about how to, how, to, how to be kind to nature, and I'm getting a little bit off the subject, but it's, but it's very much the subject of how should we build. And he has a wonderful chapter on Mumbai, and his argument is that the cities of the future will not be designed by the KPFs and the SOMs. They will be designed by the little people gradually building upward and upward and upward and upward as they flow in from the farmlands. And farmlands are uh, much more uh, demanding of resources than cities are per capita per dwelling unit. As they, as they move into the cities, they will, have, uh, they will start having fewer children because you have a lot of children on the farm in order to uh, help you farm. And in the city, they are a drag on you. And besides, in the city, there's women's liberation. And people don't have as many children. And in fact, we're seeing in Europe now, Europe is not now replacing its population biologically. It's doing it through immigration. Uh, and uh, he foresees that by the year 2050, uh, the world population will begin to drop. And that leads to another whole set of fascinating issues. But I think the question then is, how do we build? And I think that uh, uh, I'm fascinated by the idea that, that, as Jane Jacobs said, every famous neighborhood was once a slum at some point in its history. And slums unslum themselves gradually over time by virtue of the work of the people that's in them. Uh, he has some fascinating statistics on the number of people in Mumbai, in the slums of Mumbai, who have cell phones. That's uh, like 90%, something like that. And all this communication that's going on all over the world as people find ways uh, to uh, bring themselves up. But I'll, I'll stop with that and uh, maybe answer any questions that people have them as we get into the discussion with George. And George did not actually learn anything about architecture from me, but I've learned something about architecture from him. <laughs> Let's
let's take our customary about 10 minute break.